The Artist's Toolkit, a training program for the artistic process, problems, background, and exercises. Hi and welcome. This is Katie Wenzel with The Artist's Toolkit, your training program for developing your own personal artistic tools. And today is actually not about anything literal that you can practice. It's not about a mental or physical training. Today is kind of theoretical, but please don't drop out on me. Today is a bit about background. We're going to have a look at what is called receptions of aesthetics. I know it sounds terrible, but please bear with me. We're looking at this from a maker's perspective. And remember, if you want to build a bike, you need to know how it works. And it's similar with art and aesthetics of reception. Sounds terrible, but it's really about how does art work? How does art work? How does art work when people look at it? And actually, that's, that is a really interesting question also for people who make art or should be. So, yeah, this is a field in cultural science, art history, uh, also in literature. But it's, it also concerns us. Because, for example, a lot of people, when they look at art, they wonder, what did the artist mean? What was the artist trying to tell us? And one thing that the 20th century brought us is that, honestly, it doesn't matter one bit what the artist is trying to tell you. It doesn't matter at all. The only thing that counts is whether that piece means something to you, whether it resonates with you or not. You know, I spent many, many years as a, as a tour guide in, in, the, in the state museums in Berlin. Uh, it was great fun. I've probably dragged thousands and thousands of people through the museums and, you know, stood with them in front of works of art and discussed. And I can tell you from direct experience and my self-collected empirical data that, yes, a piece of art works in that moment when it resonates with you. Art happens in this little moment when you, you know, when you have this ding. If you go through the museum for two hours with ten people and everybody has a ding moment, then you've done really well. And it will also be, it will be a different ding in a different place for every single person there. In the 19th century, it was considered a crucial question, what does the artist mean? You know, the, the idea was, of course, that the artist is a genius the artist is someone who knows more about the world than other people. And geniuses, as you know, also tended to be white men, white middle-class men mostly. Well, okay, so today our ideas are different. In the 21st century or after the end of the 20th century, the question is mainly about why is art important for us or what kind of reaction does art create? And why, you know, why does it fascinate people? And of course, this depends on who is looking at it and on the situation. And I very much hope that you all have your very favorite artworks that you know well, that you need to keep coming back to, and that always mean something new to you, and that, you know, the meaning of which keeps changing. I'm sure you also have favorite books and favorite movies which are the same. You know, you know, that kind of movie that you want to watch for the 14th time and everybody else is just groaning and, and bored, but for you it is always new. And there will be others which used to fascinate you and which have lost importance. Because, probably, these works are about things that you were going through that had to do with your own personal development and there will be stuff that you, you're done with at some point, consciously, unconsciously mixed. And, um, but of course, there will be stuff that will be important for you throughout all your life. And of course, that will also have to do with the form, the formal design of the work that keeps fascinating you. And you will keep coming back to it. The Artist's Toolkit. So, what is the artist trying to tell us? Well, first of all, if we have an artist here, it's supposed to be you. And second, when you are not the artist but the beholder, then the artist is really uninteresting. What's interesting is you as a beholder. Interesting is what happens within you. 
That's the first thing. Second thing, following from point number one, is what does it mean for your own work? What does it mean when you work hands-on practically? Because this is what we here are all about. What this means for your work is that if you want your work to be for the public, if you want your work not to be just your own private small discussion between yourself and the material or between yourself and the concept, if you want to work for the outside, if you want your work to have an effect, then you should be aware that this is more than just a private little discussion. No, there is no, you know, nothing against private little discussions. We all need to take care of our private stuff. And not everything needs to be for everybody else, of course. But if you work for a show or for the public realm, or if you just want to go into the public with your work, please remember that you're probably working about things you find interesting and that resonate with you. At this point in your inner development, and with your conflicts and whatever is going on with you. But if you take your work out into the public, it's not so much about you anymore. It's about giving the others something to work with. It's about giving the others something to, that resonates with them. And that means to create a certain openness to leave kind of a gap within your work. What does that mean? Well, firstly, it means I want to get you away, just in case you're doing this, I want to get you away from the idea that if you create uh, some kind of surrealist, symbolic pieces where you say, this thing means this, this color means that, and this means something else, if in case, and it happens with a lot of beginners, and I've done it, and everybody else has done it, and famous people have done it, If you try to create fixed significance in your work and then expect the others to read it like words, like a text, this is probably going to go wrong, like 90% of the cases. And I want to get you away from that. Because experience shows it doesn't work so well and it normally is much more fun to invite people to a dialogue. A dialogue is more interesting than you know, just churning out a statement. This is about entering into a conversation, into communication. This is about you creating a situation, an object, or uh, an action that invites to communication. And in a way, you can probably say that a good artwork is a little bit like putting a bike out into the street and allowing everybody else to do with it what they want. And some will ride the bike, and some will not ride the bike, and some will ride it around the corner, and others will make a tour into the, uh, to the Sahara, and some will just ignore it. And that's up to them. That's not up to you. You just put something out there, and it's up to the others to decide what they do with it. But you put something out there that is important, what you've made, constructed, thought over, poured over, and then it's up to the others to engage with it. And in order to do that, there must be a little space. If you put out a bike that has no wheels or that with wheels that don't move, this is a kind of statement too. But it means that the others can do a lot less with it. And here we come to a classical problem of art, which you certainly know. This is something that sometimes people in the sciences especially people who are not such great people in the sciences, tend to say about art. You know, this, this kind of slightly spiteful, ah, oh, well, art, literature, it's all completely random. Everybody and everyone makes it their own and everybody puts in their own interpretation. And um, yeah, by the way, I've never ever heard that from real scientists. They know how relative everything is. But, well, random. This is, of course, rubbish. Of course it is true that art works differently than a, than a mathematical formula. Formulas are there to define things. They are meant to be precise. And often 
you know, to describe shapes. Mathematics are all about describing shapes. I wish somebody had told me that in school. Uh, maybe I would have been better in mathematics then. Art is also precise. But I think our precision is more about design and execution and organization. And our, <laughs> our product or whatever, the, the, whatever we create, it will be open. It opens up fields of meaning. And as I said, I've seen very often how people interpreted the same artwork differently and they reacted differently to it. So they received it differently. That's why it's called aesthetics of reception. But this is not random. I have never seen it that people looked at the same artwork and one said, I find it really funny and somebody else says, no, I find it tragic. Of course, something happens like You all look at Kobe's The Wave and you have this huge, gray, menacing wave, ocean wave under a dark sky. And then you have people who say, I like it or I don't like it. And they have people who say, I find it oppressive. And there are people who say, I don't find it oppressive at all. I find it liberating and impressive and it has so much energy and it's wild. And then you look at it again. And you need to, you know, you need to differentiate a bit. It sounds like a contradiction, but it isn't. Because if you talk about what people perceive in detail, then you will find out that, well, one person sees the power of nature, wild forests, and one finds it intimidating and the other finds it liberating. So you have two different reactions, but the feeling the thing that came across the first impression was actually quite close. They just reacted differently to the impression they received. The artist's toolkit. So, please remember, artworks open fields of meaning and people who look at it may be placed in different places in this field, but they are still normally inside the same field unless they're not looking. This, of course, can happen too, but that's also okay. Okay, now you will tell me, nice, that's a lot of very nice theory, but how am I to get there? How am I to create something that has no definite meaning? Because people may read things differently, because if I put a nail into my piece, uh, one may say, oh, a nail, a nail is about injury, and somebody else will say, ah, Nail, it's about construction. Nail is about building stuff. Uh, what am I to do about this? Opening up fields of meaning, how is that supposed to work? And that is, of course, the one big question uh, for which everybody has to find their own answer or many answers. And honestly, I think there are as many and as few ways there that, well, there is no recipe. I mean, th this is what art is all about, how to open up a field of meaning and find out over and over again how to do it. But of course, there are kind of shortcuts or tips, which are just a very, very small part of what is possible. So one tip is, if you work on something that you want to show, that you want to share, talk about it with others. And I always recommend find a group, meet up, work together, three or four people, and talk about what you're doing, and talk about your reactions. And that's one of the best methods ever. Doesn't work for me. Doesn't rock my boat. Yeah, that means that at this moment in time, the other person, your piece isn't resonating with the other person. That is okay. And then there are two more tips, which are more on the making side. Tip number two is, and here we're back, in practice. Tip number two is something like create gaps. So tip number one is as so often discuss things with your group, have a test group, have a peer group and, and learn to give and receive also difficult feedback. Tip number two is, and this is much more hands-on and practical, tip number two is like something like create gaps. What does that mean? That means when you 
create a kind of object, situation, action that is there for others to engage with. Then it helps to leave places for them to engage, like places to hook into. And if you release a completely rounded, finished statement into the world, then it can very happen easily that people, you know, just shrug and say, yeah, well, well then. And of course, there are pieces which are formally complete and rounded. This is not what this is about. What I mean is to leave the possibility for a beholder to find a little door. And one of these little doors can be if you work in fragments or with unclarities and impurities. This is, of course, not a standard recipe. This is, this is maybe... This is just a trick for 2% of all possible cases. And especially it's not, you know, it's not true the other way around. It doesn't mean that something that is completely perfect in every detail must be boring. Not at all. This is just one approach, one way that may help you in the beginning. It's just an exercise and I want you to experiment with it. Because... This is a big thing, the gap, the emptiness, leaving something empty, leaving space, leaving space unused and accepting emptiness as something that is quite as important, though in a different way, than something. This is something that we haven't got a long tradition with in the West and also artistically. People have been discussing this here maybe since the middle of the 19th century. It's easy to date, we'll get to that, but in the long, large European tradition, this idea that emptiness is as important as something isn't really there. For example, we have numbers, numbers going back to antiquity. And it took a long time, it took until the Middle Ages, until the concept of zero made it to Europe. Zero is, of course, special. Zero is different from one, two, three, four, five. Zero is a sign for here is nothing. Zero is a sign for not something. And if you think about it for a moment, this is really an interesting concept. And it's really fascinating. And it is something that comes originally from India and was adopted in Arabia and then made it to Europe. And of course, this is not just a number. This is a philosophical concept. The idea that nothing is as important as something. This is a thought that is also important in Buddhism. It's a thought that is important in Asia, in Asian art, long before people started thinking about it here. Because in Europe, for a long time, the tendency was to say, okay, well, we have space here and I'll make it full or I'll, you know, I'll partition it, maybe symmetrical or in, in good proportions and that makes good feelings of stability, it's safe and harmonic and that's great. But in the 19th century, after the opening of Japan in the 1860s, suddenly there were very new concepts and that led to a lot of discussion and developments. And I think this is still ongoing. So, opening up of Japan, you may, you may remember it. Um, Japan in the 16th and 17th century had contact with Europeans, European missionaries, for a while. But then people in Japan decided that they were sick of foreigners meddling with their interior politics and kicked them out. And after that, Japan became a closed island and nobody from the West was allowed to to land there. It was, a, it was a secret archipelago. Until in the 1860s, they were forced by the United States with weapons. They were, they were actually forced with cannons to open a, a trading post in Yokohama and open a port for European ships also. So at that time, suddenly a lot of objects from Japan, prints, painting, etc. came to Europe. And people here were completely amazed because there was such a different treatment of space. Because 
we, we also have this in Chinese art and so on, but especially in Japanese art, there is this idea that harmony means that there is a balance between fullness and emptiness. And of course, this has also to do with communication, with the idea that when you're sending all the time, talking, and never listen, there is no conversation, there is no dialogue. In Japanese, there is actually a word for, for this giving space, not sending, for receiving, which is uh, ma. As far as I know, the word is ma. And of course, it's great to have a word for it. Uh, I wish we had one because we have this tradition that how important it is to learn how to talk in public. And everybody is always talking and sending, especially on social media, But what about receiving? What about listening? What about letting things sit and ferment and work? You know, this is something that you do or allow, and it's also an interior process. It takes energy. It, it's something you do. It's, it's not just not doing. And if you want to learn stuff about the world, and if you want to learn stuff about other people, of course you cannot be making, sending, talking, thinking all the time. You need to go to switch into receptive mode for a moment, um, into the opposite state and just, you know, make space, be still and allow things to reach you. And that's not so simple at all and it also can be scary and, and takes actually a lot of energy. And if you're under pressure, it doesn't work at all. The Artist's Toolkit So, staying still, making space making space for what some, somebody else is saying or what, how somebody else is thinking and how somebody else just is, which you may not find so great, but which also can be exciting. All these are things that you, you, know, you need to allow and for which you need in a certain way an active. And this is connected to the idea of making art where you leave space where there is empty, free space and where there is space that in the end ultimately allows the beholder, the people you look, who look at the art to connect with it, to fill it, to fill it with their imagination and to project onto it. Now that works for empty space, it works even better for for things which are out of focus. It works for things which are missing. You know, and it, it's also a psychological concept. Uh, you can watch whatever, whatever rom-com you want and there will always be some mysterious person that nobody really knows anything about and that will be the one person that everybody is in love with because they can project onto them. Good. So this is This is it. You need to leave a little space for people to project into so that they can fall in love with your piece. Also, for example, maybe you know this. When you've been to a museum or better still, if you've been to an excavation site, you may have seen stuff that was just fragments, broken pieces. And very often these fragments and shards are even more interesting than the complete piece would be. Because you're standing in front of it and wondering and thinking, thinking, how was this? What did this look like when it was complete? What was the Forum Romanum like when it was complete? Well, the Forum Romanum existed over 1,500 years, so it, it looked different every 50 years or so. But it doesn't matter. When you look at a ruin, then you're already beginning to complete it, to rebuild it in your imagination. And that means you are already engaging. Your imagination is working. Something is happening. And then things will begin to develop and you have reactions. And it resonates with you. This is a very simple method to do something. And it's a good example to show how the, this works. To do something that a beholder can engage with. It's similar with fog, for example. If you create fog in whatever you're doing, they're also... Your spectators, your beholders, the other side, they directly start to try to understand it, to, to get through to it and to complete it in their imagination. And you have gotten an emotional reaction immediately. 
exercise. So this is what the exercise today is all about. I want you to experiment with this. I would like you to make something, you know, just something simple or small, an object, an action, create a situation, make a drawing, a collage, photograph, a video, whatever, where you test this out, this gap thing, where you work with fragments, where you work with things out of focus, with, with, with things which aren't clearly visible. And of course, there are different methods. For example, you, you can take something that is finished and break it or wipe something out, draw over something, erase something, paste something over or remove something in any way and produce a fragment. Or you can produce something that is a fragment right from the beginning. Or you can create a fog. For example, make a nice cup of tea. That happens quickly. You can have a work on paper and, you know, burn it, take it under the shower with you. There are so, so many possibilities. And of course, there are also actions which are incomplete or mm, movies which are incomplete. There's so many possibilities. Please try them out. Play a bit. And before we finish, there's one big disclaimer. Disclaimer. This is not a standard method, how you, how, how you make art or how you can engage people who look at your art. This is just one of the infinitely many possibilities which are very, very difficult to define and which always need to be invented and reinvented. And I've just picked this one method because it's good to explain and it's good to practice. That's why I picked this one tiny part aspect. So if you, for example, if you have a spice cabinet with 500 different spices, then this is just one, like, then maybe this is bezel. Okay, so what I'm going to say, it's just a very, very small aspect among an infinity of possibilities. But I picked this because I thought it's, it can help you to understand the mechanism. Well, so I hope you've heard something that you found exciting today. I hope you, tonight you go to bed with a feeling that you're smarter than when you got up in the morning. I like that very much when that happens. And yes, I wish I could see what you're going to do. To do. Enjoy. And of course, as always, for all those of you who may feel they want to look into this a bit more deeply. I have two reading recommendations. One is a standard work of German art history. It's a little older, but it's still as as fresh as it was on the first day. It's by German art historian Wolfgang Kemp, K-E-M-P, Wolfgang Kemp, The Work of Art and Its Beholder, The Methodology of the Aesthetic of Reception. In Mark A. Cheatham, C H E E T H A M, Mark A. Cheatham, Michael Ann Holly, Keith Moxie. The subjects of art history, historical objects in contemporary perspective, Cambridge University Press, Cambridge 1998, page 180 to 196. And about the subject of Ma, the Japanese concept of leaving space, try James McRae, Art of War, Art of Self. Aesthetic Cultivation in Japanese Martial Arts in A. Min Nguyen, A. Min Nguyen, M I N H N G U Y E N. New Essays in Japanese Aesthetics, Lexington Books, Lanham Boulder, New York, London, 2017, page 121 to 136. The Artist's Toolkit. Conceptualized and presented by Kata Wenzel. Assistance, Nodja Driller. A project by European University Flensburg.